Welcome to Crazy Shit in Real Estate, a weekly podcast where I walk you through some of the wildest, most unbelievable stories you'll hear from the world of real estate. If you like real estate and you love crazy, this is a podcast for you. And welcome back to the show. I'm Lee Brown, and you're listening to Crazy Shit in Real Estate, where we do our doggone best to give you all the different angles of real estate that you never knew existed because it ain't the way HDTV shows it to you. So today, I'm super excited to bring y'all a guest who's not only a real estate broker, but she also does a little bit of coaching on the side. Whitney, nicely. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Lee. It's going to be fun. So tell the crew where you're located, how long you've been messing in real estate, all those little fun tidbits. I'm in Knoxville, Tennessee, and I flipped my first house in 09. So I've been in it for nine years. And I have land, I have houses, and I have apartment complexes all over East Tennessee now. So basically, you're like a land mogul of sorts. Yes. I yes. kind of love that because that's a piece <laughs> that people don't talk about nearly enough. So fabulous angle for the show. So let me give you the quick ground rules of the podcast. We're so easy over here. You can say pretty much whatever you want, except for the F4 GD or see you next Tuesday because I'm allergic to the big ones. And if there's a guilty party at any point involved in any of your stories, please just don't name their name. Make up something good. But with that being said, I'd love to know what crazy thing you've encountered in your real estate dealings, especially knowing that you started all this process during the recession. Well, let me ask you, make sure we're talking about the same F word. Is that foreclosure? Because I hate that word. You know, people don't really know what that means. We can call it REO if you'd like, but you know, REO uh, includes other people explaining what words are. So you could say a house that somebody didn't pay for. <laughs> yeah. I just, I don't deal with those and I, I can't stand it. And <laughs> I, I guess that's the most frustrating thing for me in real estate is people like, oh, you buy a bunch of foreclosures? No, there's other ways to make money than doing that. Well, then I'd love for you to give us some insight on that because it, it really is funny. And you know this too. There are people that call us today in 2018 who expect to get the deals of 2009 and get a little offended when we don't have those kind of properties in the market. But then they really don't even want to listen to the whole story. But there's always something out there to buy if you've got the right eyes for it. So tell people about how you got the eye for it and what you've encountered in that process. Well, when I was a kid, my mom used to take me out to new builds and we just walk around and she'd show me, you know, how the electric really looks behind the wall and what the plumbing looks like. And so I was pretty much <laughs> raised for this kind of business, kind of on accident. But my mom definitely taught me a lot of stuff that I don't think a lot of people get exposed to. So was my she a realtor also, or a builder or both? No, she's none of those. She graduated high school and went to work for her dad's company and she is totally self-taught. And in 2003, when I graduated high school, my mom made $19,000 a year. And with that $19,000 that she'd been earning since she graduated high school in the 70s, she managed to buy three or four houses and have rental income. So we were always going to the mailbox at the first of the month to get the rent checks. And I know that's how she made the ends meet on a very low salary. So... Let's talk about that for a minute because there are a lot of, and, and this is one of my soapboxes, which is, of course, why I'm going to go down this road. But there's a lot of women that say that women are held back when it comes to real estate and houses and property stuff. How do you feel about that? I agree. And I fight for the women every single day because I was raised by a strong mother. Most of us are raised by a strong mother, but my mom was strong in real estate from the very beginning. And she taught me that if I wanted something, I could go out and buy it. I didn't need to wait on a man to buy me something. And I didn't need to depend on a man and his opinion if I was looking at an investment. And so my mom raised me to look at the deals myself. And even when I started questioning her and how she was buying stuff and why she would buy this and if she has a strategy and all this stuff, I outgrew her really quickly in real estate investing. And she told me to go figure it out on my own. And I did. And now I've got more houses than she does. <laughs> But girl, that means nobody held her back and nobody held you back because y'all just said, you know what? Screw this. We'll go figure it out and make it happen. And Absolutely. I love that about real estate. It gives you a way to, to really be entrepreneurial and whatever way makes sense for you. For your mom, it was those houses that she bought. For you, it's moved into land and flips. So talk to me about how you got over the fear of the first flip, because we know the first one can be a scary thing. Well, the first one, the very first one, actually the first five I did were my mom's. I was working with mom and dad and it would take us six months to flip a house. And then there was always some lingering projects going on. And so in 2014, I said, I can't stand this anymore. Y'all <laughs> move too slow for me. I got to take the training wheels off. And so I got a house and I flipped it in about six weeks. 
So I was super excited about it. And I learned a ton. I thought I'd learned a lot working on their flips. Mm -hmm. But when it's your money and your project and you're the one in charge, totally different booger. And then I went on from 14. I did two and 14. And then I did six and 15 and decided that was enough. I didn't want to do that anymore. I'd learned everything I wanted to know. (laughs) Okay. So we have a lot of regular people who listen to the podcast who are not realtors. So tell them from the perspective of the flipper. So not necessarily as the realtor version of the flipper, but when you go and look at something, what are you looking for? What are the biggest things people don't plan for? And what's the advice you would give to somebody getting started? Because obviously they watch these TV shows and you and I both know they're way out of line with the expectations they're setting. The TV shows are crazy and crap, but The biggest thing that I go to look for, I'm always going to assume there's some water damage, whether it's on the corner of the house, whether it's an old toilet that leaked and the subfloor is rotted or whatever. There's going to be some water damage. And if you'll just go ahead and factor that on in, you won't be caught off guard. You know, it won't be a huge surprise like on the shows when it's a big surprise. Um, Another thing is, you know, sometimes sinks have water damage. They, you know, ruin the cabinets underneath. But what I really try to do and what I started doing in 2016, 2017, instead of going in and planning on gutting the whole house, I would just do one room or I would do one major thing in a couple different rooms. Like I'd go through and put all new carpet in the whole house and then change the kitchen knobs or change the doorknobs throughout the house. I don't want to go through and tear out kitchens and bathrooms anymore because if you spend 20 or 30,000 and then you make 20 or 30,000, then you did all this for basically nothing. Mm -hmm. But if you can go in and spend two or 3,000 and make 20 or 30,000 now, now we're talking. And frankly, if what you're doing makes the existing product fine, it's also a way greener way to flip because you're not oh, creating yeah. so much waste in landfills. And I think we don't talk about that at all when we're talking in flip world about how much waste is going on. And I know that our local Habitat for Humanity reaches out all the time and says, hey, we'll take it if y'all are going to throw it out. But what you're saying is most of the time, it doesn't even have to be thrown out if you look at it with the right eyes. Well, a lot of these houses that I'm buying are nice, fine, happy houses. They're not, you know, falling apart. They're not a disaster. It's just that whoever owned it, you know, if they bought it in 2000, maybe they haven't updated it since 2000 and tastes have changed. So maybe you just go into the kitchen and the bathrooms and you put granite in and boom, it's fine. What's the biggest thing you've seen that was mind blowing in this world that you've wandered into? People have houses that are empty that they're making payments on because they don't want their credit to suffer, but they don't want to take the energy and the effort to put a tenant in it or to sell it. Or maybe they tried to sell it and sometimes they have the wrong agent or it's the wrong time of year or something happened. And people will hold on to houses and make payments on an empty house for years. They will skip vacations. They will skip upgrading their car. They will do so many things to keep an empty house empty. And it it blows my mind. And so as many of those people as I can find, and I can help, you know, with some relief, I can take these payments over for them. Those people are thrilled and they hug my neck. And they're usually fine houses. They're the houses that just need a little bit of a lipstick on a pig kind of flip. So how are you finding these folks just by driving around and knowing your market and seeing which houses are vacant and going to the tax records? Or is there some kind of a magical process you've developed? Yeah, it's on Facebook. You just hop on Facebook and tell everybody you're looking for people that have empty (laughs) houses that they're making payments on. And you'll be surprised how many of your friends and family know people in their friends and family list that are doing that. And they're ashamed of it. And when you become the person that they can confess all this to, and you become the person that they know can help them with this, you don't have to do anything else. So let me go back to something else you said, too, because Obviously, when somebody reaches out to you, they've already been through the ringer on whatever other path they tried. You said they may not have had the right realtor. Do you believe that a person who has an investment property of some sort should use a realtor who either owns investment properties or has significant experience in them? Do you believe it's a different aspect of real estate? Yes. The best agents are also investors, but the best investors I know don't have a license. Okay, so say that one more time. The best agents you know are investors, but the best investors don't have a license. Yeah, it's a little riddle. 
So why do you think realtors don't invest enough? Uh, they're so focused on getting that clear to close. They're so focused on helping other people make money. A lot of realtors are women and we have this maternal instinct to help everybody and make sure everybody else is happy and safe and collected and all this stuff. And we just want to help, help, help. And then we give, give, give until we turn around and we're like, crap. Why don't we have anything? Why don't why didn't I buy that? Why didn't I do this? Why we don't want to put ourselves first. We feel like that's selfish. It's okay to be selfish, guys. Your retirement is yours. You need to be building that up yourself. And a lot of agents can't see the forest for the trees or they're so bogged down in getting continuing education that doesn't actually continue their education and just meets a requirement for the state that they don't invest outside of what they're going to get, you know, credit for. Whether or not it actually improves their financial situation, they're not concerned about that. I think you may have hit on something here because I've always thought about people not investing from a fear standpoint. Because, you know, you hear the horror stories of a bad tenant or how somebody lost money. But you totally went after that emotional side where I think you're exactly right that so many realtors, because they're wired to take care of people, they're not even thinking about taking care of themselves. And it's not for lack of wanting to. They just put themselves last. That's a fascinating insight. And I bet you're right. And, you know, the fear is what they blame it on. But come on, we know people that have lost money in the stock market. Is anybody not getting into the stocks? No. Right. We know people that have lost money on a bad car investment. Do people stop buying cars? No. Well, I mean, you can use President Trump as an example. He went bankrupt a couple of times, picks up and keeps going and winds up as president without any political background. I mean, you can do anything in America. Exactly. <laughs> you so, can become rich. <laughs> so then... And your coaching life, when you're trying to help other people, are you coaching investors as to how to get going in that angle? Or are you coaching realtors how to become investors or work with them? Or what's your specialty on that front? Because it sounds like your passion is all about getting people to think about real estate in a bigger way. I do help agents become investors because there's a fine line. There's a bunch of disclosures. There's other things that you got to do that you have to consider. And so I bring from the agent going into investing perspective, but I really focus on women because I bring a different perspective of bumping into the good old boys club as a woman. Also, you know, when we negotiate just in our everyday life, men and women speak basically different languages. Mm -hmm. And I bring that to the women so that they don't have to go through the good old boys club and then bring it back. And like I did, transcribe it into women speak, <laughs> women talk, you know, we could just pick up the ball and start rolling with it immediately. I am working though on 2018, helping established investors make more money with their investments or make their next investment bigger, better, and better. A lot of landlords get kind of stuck in two or three or four or five houses. And that's great, but it's it's really going to keep them busier than it is richer. Mm -hmm. So I want to help them move into small apartments or even, you know, some larger apartments up to 20 units. Because so, in my area, you can buy a five unit apartment complex for the same thing you can buy a house for. You want five people paying you or one? Um, I, <laughs> I might need to talk to you. I, my husband and I, we buy a property every year. So that's our our personal goal is to build our empire strategically like that. And we bought our first commercial property in 2017, and I could just smack myself for not having gone that direction sooner instead of single family, I although know. not to delay how big a deal single family investing is. But when you start thinking bigger, like you're talking about with apartments, it's an entirely different ballgame. So I think you should probably send me some of the information on these <laughs> five unit apartment complexes because I'll be. And it's not just them. apartments. It's trailer parks and storage units. Girl, trailer and parks are also known as an ATM. Those things are fantastic for cash flow. I know. And it's basically land in a septic system. And frankly, I think it's Southerners who don't look poorly upon trailer parks because that's our people. And we do not look badly upon any kind of trailer parks that's don't go empty. No, nope. absolutely. Trailer parks don't go empty there. No matter what the economy is doing, that trailer park is full, baby. Well, you know, the the issue of affordability and housing is getting to be a bigger and bigger deal. And that's one of the honestly last good private ways you can have an affordable living situation. Yep. All right, girl, you've got so many irons in the fire. I'm so <laughs> stinking excited about this. How can realtors reach out to you if they want to know more about what you offer on that front? How can consumers reach out to you if they want to know about the whole flipping and investing and how you could be their agent? So you've got two different pieces of your life. Tell the world how to find you. So if you'll go to WhitneyNicely.com slash group, 
that'll send you straight to my Facebook group. I'm super mouthy in there all day, every day. And that's honestly the best way to get in touch with me. WhitneyNicely.com slash group. So if you're listening to this episode and you've got as much energy right now as I do after just talking to Whitney for a few minutes, never fear (laughs) if you didn't write down her information or if you don't speak Southern, because I'll have all the information in the show notes for this episode so you can stalk her online, friend her and ask her questions. And by the way, if you're listening to this and you're not investing yet, do not wait for the next market downturn because real estate is not something you can time as everybody learned in the last one. You find something that makes sense, you pull the trigger and you make it work and it happens in every market condition. Whitney, thank you for coming on the podcast. It's been a pleasure to hear your energy and all the projects you have starting. Thanks, Lee. It's great. And if you're listening to this and you're a realtor, broker, investor, inspector, lender, you're just a regular old normal person who's got your own story about something in or around real estate that's crazy to you, give me a shout at Lee Brown on Twitter or any of the social networks to be featured in a future episode. And as always, subscribe for more and we'll see you next time. Thanks for joining us this week on the Crazy Shit in Real Estate podcast. If you liked what you heard, please visit crazyshitinrealestate.com where you can access the full show notes for this episode, additional content produced exclusively for listeners, and much, much more.